What's going on, everybody? Oh, now! I vanished! <laughs> I'm in the dark. Can you see me? No, you cannot! Now you can! <laughs> oh, no, watch this, watch. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, yes. Oh, no. Oh, yes! <laughs> Apparently that was my fault. <laughs> oh yeah, we gotta crank this baby up. Ugh. I'm running a little late, but that's because we have so much going on. We have a ridiculous amount of stuff going on right now. Unbelievable, this show is jam packed. It's the super show, you don't even know. And why? It's simple, because we have brought on board contributors. We have folks like Jake Fowler. We have David Haleva. They're going to be talking about the Council of Nicaea. They're going to be talking about reflections on Advent. We've got that. We've got a special announcement. In fact, we've got a couple special announcements. One of which, lest I forget, congratulations to my boy, Timothy Gordon. Apparently, he is uh, replenishing the earth <laughs> with baby number seven. Baby number seven from the Gordon family. Big announcement was made. Ah, uh, making the world a better place for Christ the King, bro. Congratulations, man. We'll be adding you to the prayer list. All right, I hope you got your coffee ready. Make sure you got the straw, as we have demonstrated time and time again on this program. Drinking coffee through a straw bypasses the blood-brain barrier. <laughs> totally true. It's totally true. All right, I want to see those wolves in that comment section. I'm already seeing it right now. Yes, happy Feast of St. Francis Xavier and First Friday of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. First Friday, make sure to go to Mass if you can. Make, make, that, a, make that a habit if you can. Uh, thank you for that reminder, by the way, David, in the comments. Phil, Wolf, no, Phil, not Wolf. Ah, there you go, now you've got it. <laughs> he, he, put, he put Wolf. <laughs> what, what, what are you doing? Wolf spelled out. I mean, that's like a halfway house, man. It's like a halfway house. Uh, sorry for that. Sorry for that rough start there. Sorry for that rough start. We've got a really good show for you, though. You know, we just do. We have an amazing show for you. Why is my CPU so high? I don't even know. <laughs> it's like 21% right now. My, my steam is starting to come off my computer. And I'm like, what, what the heck is going on here? Because we're on fire. We are on fire. Today is the Friday, December 3rd edition of Paleocrat Diaries. I'm your host, the OG, the one and only Jeremiah Bannister, the Paleocrat. It's totally true. Totally true. So, look, I don't want to take forever with introductions. Okay, we normally do. We normally kind of schmooze and stuff like that. However, however, I do want to show this. This is special. Oh, no. Hold on. We're going to have to we're going to have to bump this thing up. Let's let's just share something else. And that way it'll bump up here. There we go. Do there. Here we go. Boink. Look at this. Look at this. I got this message yesterday. That right there, that right there is Wolfpack Cub number two. <laughs> number two, Brianna and Matt. Okay. You got you got Raymond Leo Lamb. Very, very excited about that. Named uh, in honor of uh, Cardinal Raymond Burke. Okay, and proud dad Matt Lamb, he's over at LifeSite News as well as thecollegefix.com. Make sure to check that out. Uh, and so, yes, his wife, Brianna, she is the mastermind, the, the techie behind the scenes, behind the curtain there over at paleocraddiaries.com. And it was crazy because, you know, I felt really badly. I'm like, man, you know, I, I need to reach out to her. You know, I know she's a busy lady and stuff. I didn't even know she was pregnant. <laughs> she didn't tell me. She didn't tell me. We did. We picked her up not long ago to help out with the site, and uh, and I just I was unaware. But I was made aware yesterday, right here. People started praying for the family, right? Praying, praying. Look, is, do we pray it through? <laughs> do we pray a little Raymond, just like we did we, 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 when we prayed little Alphonsus? Is that how it works out? People are like, look, my daughter's in labor. She's been in labor for a while. It's taking longer than we were hoping. Please pray. And we're like, don't worry about it, bud. Do not fret. Do not let your heart be troubled. And make sure, if you want to follow updates like this, oh, including this, check this out. <laughs> yeah, the Glad Trad Super Friends. My wife made that. And, and it, it might be difficult to see because there's so much detail in the, in the faces and stuff. But here's the thing about that is that each one of those faces, those are different people who are involved in the uh, administration and moderation 
of all things paleocrat on Telegram. Now we did, however, we ran out of ladies, and so we're gonna we're gonna do some really cool ones there with Haley because Haley is such a an essential part of everything that we do here, and so we wanted to make sure that Haley got in there, and that's gonna be a whole bunch of fun. But my wife, she shared that. We had a uh, yesterday. It was it was crazy. I mean, I think we went. <laughs> I think that's a great that's a great uh, video. By the way, it's hilarious. Father Ripburger. Yeah, straight to the dome, out of the pot. <laughs> what? Tell me that's not coffee, man. <laughs> Tell me that is not coffee. That girl, is, that girl is adorable, though, man. We love our Wolfpack Cubs, don't we? We love our Wolfpack Cubs. As you can see, it says Anthony and Steven and David. All these different people, they're commenting right now in the Paleocrat Diaries Wolfpack chat, as well, of course, as over on, uh, over on YouTube in the comments section. So... If you want to be part of that, and by the way, I have to say this, okay? I have, I'll, I'll, I'll just show it for a second. I'm not going to go into huge detail or anything like that, but I have to show it because this is this right here. This is about people who are uh, members of the uh, Paleocrat Diaries. They're patrons, okay? So I created this this site here, this uh, Telegram group, so that we can communicate with each other. This is the main. This is the super friends of Paleocrat Diaries. These are people who are over on Patreon or over on Wix. This is just a, a sampling. I showed a video of that. I, we did a, a live stream of it or premiere of it. So talking about how it works and how you can download any of these videos or MP3s or pictures. And that that is where from now on, I'm going to be posting the screenshots from the show. I'm going to post videos, exclusive uh, video chats, audio chats, as well as phone calls and DMs to individual patrons, it is so much easier to do it the one-stop shop right over here. I, I literally loathe <laughs> going to Patreon. I do. I'm, I'm grateful for the service. I'm grateful for the service. But it's just one of those things, you know, where uh, it, it's a real nuisance because if you want to post a, if you want to post a, a podcast, well, you better have yourself, you know, an Acast or a Spreaker account or something like that. Uh, I think they've they've teamed up with Acast. Uh, if you if you want to do a video, you have to either upload it to Vimeo or upload it to YouTube, and then you upload it there. That sort of a thing, and it drives me nuts. I'm like, look, you know, I don't I don't want to have to worry about all that. I want to be able to just upload this stuff right here. And I don't know. I mean, I guess you can. You could you'd be able to save. You know, click save as and stuff like that for for pictures, but not for videos. And I want people to be able to save the videos that I share to the members. I you know, if you want to watch them. If you want to watch them on your downtime, you want to you want to put them on a a, a flash drive, anything like that. You want to you want to download the audio MP3s. You want to make it available so you can listen to it in the car. Whatever you want, I want you to be able to do that. And there are so many limitations with Patreon. And so I'm telling you right now, I'm going to begin. You, you might get annoyed by it at first, but if you once you do this, it's not. And this is not going to have a thousand comments. This is this one right here, the main. This is only for anyone who's five dollars and more. I've got one that is only for $10 and more and one that's only for $25, the $25 crown and more, you know, anybody above that. And so it would just be those individuals. That's it. That's it. And you can go in. You don't even have to comment. You just go in. That's where you can download everything. It's superior. It's not even remotely close. Do not settle for inferior stuff. Don't do it. Don't do it. And if that requires you to download an app, and look, I would encourage you, to, you know, because I'm, I'm a digital minimalist, make sure to go and say, do I need a bunch of these other apps? If you're if you're the type of person that says, oh, my gosh, another app I got to download to my phone, then let me just encourage you that that's probably a good sign that you have at least 10 apps that you can get rid of. That you, If you're honest with yourself and you're not a hoarder of apps, that you probably don't need them. In fact, they're just taking up space. You probably haven't used them in forever. And the only reason you think you might want to keep it is because one day you might possibly have a reason to use it. I'm giving you reasons like crazy to do this, even if it's the only page you follow. You don't, I'm not you don't have to go to the Wolfpack chat. You don't have to go to the prayer room, although I would encourage you to do that, right? Especially, especially more than anything else, that prayer room. Because people are praying and God is moving, period, Period. We're seeing it. You can any anybody who's in there, you feel it. You know it's true. We get results. People have sent prayer uh, prayer requests as well as praise reports. And look, especially look if you're pregnant. <laughs> I think this is our brand at this point, guys. You know, if if you're pregnant or your lady's pregnant, okay, and you're like, man, 
It's kind of taking a minute. I wish it was going a little faster. <laughs> Reach out to the boys and the girls over at the Wolfpack Prayer Chain because we we take care of business, right? We take care of business. And I, you know, I, one more time. Look, I'll do it right now. I'll just I'll, I'll put the uh, the prayer the prayer chain up. Watch this. Okay. Now check this out. I want to show you something. Okay. When I say that we that we pray, okay. I just want to show. I'm, I'm not even joking. I'm not joking about this, okay? Man, wow. It's just still going. That right there, I was the first person to put a prayer request on because I created this thing, right? Well, uh, Haley created this one, but I was the first person to put on there about finishing my novel. It's due at the end of December. Please continue praying for that, okay? But look at this. All of these prayers, we include the names. We include the what, what, what the prayer requests are for. We're up to 50 right now. Let's keep going. I'm not even joking about it. This is no joke. You know, people, people say, oh, you know, oh, you, you pray. What is this? Thoughts and prayers. You think this is thoughts and prayers? We're putting this together in long form. We're putting it together so you can copy and paste it yourself. We're pinning it to the top of the page so that you always have reference to it. And we're, that way we can also keep track. And we can say, look, you know, how, how are things going with you? We're up at 111 right now. Let's keep, oh, there we go. 119, 120. No, it'd be 119, yeah. So this is, this is uh, uh, an additional thing. We have 119 prayer requests. Yeah. Is there 120 yet? Let's see. Yes, 120. A friend from church is asking for prayers. Your son is getting surgery for his acid reflux right now. On it, praying for him and for her, uh, for her mom's heart. Thank you, Stephen. May God bless you and keep, uh, uh, and keep you. Look, this is no joke. All right? It's one of those things that we take deadly seriously. I said, if we're nothing else except for a wolf pack of prayer, then my job is my job's good. I've done my job. That's it. And we prove it every day. We put it up there. We, we, do, we do various prayers. We record various prayers. I went through a chaplet that should take about, you know, five, six minutes. Took 45 minutes, recorded. 45 minutes, bead by bead, just going around and around and around. Each prayer, mentioning it by name, raising their name up to heaven. That's what we do. So if you want to join that, if that's the only app you've got, I don't even care. Make that that app you got. Make make two rooms. Make the make the the room that you want to be for the the patrons, and make the room for the the Wolfpack prayer. The Wolfpack chat's a crazy wonderland of, of wild fun and and wonder. I mean, it just is. It's a it's a remarkable place. But it, it's a lot of stuff. There's a ton of comments in there. Okay, I think yesterday we bumped over a thousand comments, and that happens sometimes, right? So you and you don't have to read all those; you can skip right to the bottom. But the point is, if you have two of them, and you're a patron, your patron page, and the prayer, please join us in that. Please join us in that. I'm telling you, you will not regret it. You will not regret it. It will transform your life. So okay, uh, last announcement, and then we're moving on. I'm actually gonna I'm gonna start today. With uh, we'll start with an Advent reflection, okay? We'll start we'll start with the boys, an Advent reflection. That's David Haleva, uh, put together this uh, this this for him. So let's go ahead. We're gonna we're gonna check this out. Let me see. There's a, a video here. Okay, I was on I was on an interview. I remember I mentioned uh, I showed a video of uh, old fashioned Catholics. Haley Louie was on there. David L. Gray was on there. And they were talking about about your boy. <laughs> they were talking about your boy, right? And and they were uh, none of them had ever heard of it except for Haley and David. They were the only two. And David admitted what he's admitted to me. It wasn't like it was a new thing. Where he's like, sometimes I don't even know what you're talking about, but you're so entertaining, and so you know the energy of your show is nuts. And so I just I can't help but to listen. I'm you know I'm, I'm there in the background and stuff. So he's always kind of a lurker. <laughs> he's always lurking in the background while he's working. So very, very grateful for, uh, for the lurker. <laughs> I think it's what the L in, in uh, David Gray means, David Lurker Gray. <laughs> I think it's what the L stands for, right? So, but very grateful for him. But they talked about it. Well, the guys, you know, I reached out to them. I showed up in the chat. We talked. I, I've, I've gotten close with Nick, right? We've, got, we've been talking. We've spent late nights just talking on the phone, sometimes upward of an hour and a half. It's been a really great time. Well, I went on and we talked. And it's just kind of a free-floating show, you know? You... you you have a drink, you mix up a drink, they ask you what you mixed up, you know, what kind of alcoholic beverage you're drinking or whatever you're drinking, right? And so they do that. 
They ask how your day's been and they want to know for real. I mean, if it's if there's been a hard time, if you're dealing with stuff, let them know kind of thing. It's a really laid back show. They have some really cool guests. And I was on there and apparently my <laughs> my mods have calculated it and they said that I spoke for like 80, what was it, 81% of the time. <laughs> I was aiming for a hundred. I mean, like I, I wanted to get an A plus 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 plus, but I, I'll, I'll be okay with the B, I guess. But, uh, but that's what they do. They provided this forum. We talked about suffering. We talked about my daughter. We talked n not, not so much about that as much as how can people, how can people best uh, provide comfort and encouragement to individuals who are either going through a very difficult time or, or you know have gone through that and now are in the worst of possible times, right? Where they're just complete despair. What do you do in that situation? What do you do? And so we talked about that because a lot of people mean well, but sometimes what they do isn't very helpful. And so we talked about that. They, they, they discussed an individual uh, lost. It was a girl in the family. They woke up and uh, she was young. She had a seizure overnight and she died in her sleep. And so when they got in, she was already gone. And the, and the school reached out and said, look, you know, don't, don't, don't send little things and don't do this. Just, just pray for them and stuff like that. And I said, I, I would respectfully disagree a little. You know, I said, one of the things that helped me in the long run, in the long run of my life, one of those things that helped me was a chaplet that was given to me while my daughter had cancer. It was the, the, little, the little flower chaplain, okay? Little flower rosary. And that's when I said I prayed the a chaplet and I was going through the beads one by one by one. That's the chaplet that I was using. To this day, it is a major devotion for me. And so, but that was given to me during a very difficult time. And it, it, didn't, it didn't hit me until much later, but now I carry it with me all the time. And so, you know, but be careful about it too. And so that, that episode's really good. We talk, we talk about that and it was a lot of fun, but I just wanted to show you a real quick clip from the intro. It's only like a minute and a half long. It's, a, it's just a funny moment, but I'll show you that. Make sure to go check it out. Check these guys out. Go over there. And I'm, I'm dead serious about this, okay? If, if somebody in the comments section, I don't know if anybody is in the comments there. If you're in the comments, um, just make sure to, uh, um, you know, any, any of the mods there, just go ahead and just uh, share the link to Old Fashioned Catholics to that particular um, video and just pop it on. Just go over and click on it. Give them views, man. Give them a comment. Share it with your friends if you like it. And I hope you do. I mean, it's 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 a heart. It's heartbreaking and heartwarming at the same time. It was a really really great time, and those guys have a really great a really great thing going on. They're they're bona fide glad treads. They're card carrying, man. They're card carrying glad treads. These guys are not about ambulance chase, and these guys are about from the heart, everyday life. Johnny Q, Sally Sue, Catholics. That's what they're about. And they have Pastor Mike on there, you know, Father Mike over there all the time. I'm like, how did you, how'd you land that? <laughs> and so, man, I'm, I'm like, wowzers, that's a, a big name. So they have some big names, you know, I mean, yeah, they, I was on there. <laughs> you know? And so, but it's, it's a really good time. So make sure to go check it out, share that, uh, find that link in the comments, click on it. I'll add the link after the show to the description of the video. But we're going to start with this. And after this, I'll do a, a brief introduction to, uh, uh, the first reflection on the first week of Advent from uh, Paleocrat Diaries contributor, David Haleva. Okay, all right. So we are going to invite our drink Check in. It Let it, sure or our drink, our like guest cool. in. Let's add to the stream. Mr. Paleocrat, how are you, sir? Ooh. Doing doing good. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you now. All right, wonderful, man. I hate not having my nice microphone and my nice camera, but it's StreamYard, man. It's StreamYard. I know. It, whenever I use my whenever I use my condenser mic on StreamYard, it's like this kung fu movie, and it's like this old. Oh, really? Where it's dubbed, you know? And so it's oh, like right, right. you're like, hello, welcome to Paleo Crack. Exactly, yeah. and I it's the worst, and so it's an inferior microphone. It's true. But I thought it'd be better to be able to actually see my mouth move at the same time than yeah, to, uh, than to look fancy. Yeah, it's, a, it's preferential. Yeah, I've been definitely. on your mouth, so that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you sound so great. This is actually, this is the first moment that Kevin has met Paleocrat, by the way. Yeah. And, oh, I was going to ask uh, Mr. Paleocrat. I noticed, so in the title for this episode, I used your name and Paleocrat. Am I supposed to, should I remove your name? Because you're just Paleocrat here. I, well, I'm pretty anonymous. 
people don't really know who I am. Um, I like to keep it that way. So if you could take that off, that'd be really helpful. I will. No, of course not. No, I'm lying, dude. No, <laughs> no don't I, do that. I don't know. I, <laughs> what are you talking about, man? No. I, maybe I'm like, wait, you're on YouTube. Are you serious? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> you keep my name on there, man. Okay, yeah. that scared me. I was you're like, good. oh, shoot. I was looking like, how do I, in real time, how do I edit this? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> uh, no, you're good, dude. You're good. As I said, that was a whole bunch of fun. And uh, I hope that didn't rankle. <laughs> I hope that didn't rankle. Uh, Tim too much. It had a little bit of that wee wee in the background. He's probably just like, oh no, syncopation. <laughs> oh no, <laughs> what's Jeremiah doing? <laughs> yeah, but it, it went really well. Turn that mic up, you know. And so, yeah, they, uh, that was a really fun time. That was kind of a fun clip. You know, yeah, can I use your name? <laughs> what are you talking about, man? My face is on here, dude. It's got my name and Paleocrat right there. You know what that means? They're not watching the show, <laughs> Nick. You're busted, bro. You're busted. You cut off, homie. All the way, dude. All the way. So, all right, let's go real quick. We're gonna we're gonna go uh, right into this first clip. Uh, let's see how long is it. It's 18 minutes long, so you can uh, definitely enjoy this. It's a great time. Uh, really good reflections on the first week of Advent. This is put together by David Haleva. You can find him in the comments section. Uh, you'll find him. Yeah, he changed. Oh, he, okay, so he changed it. He's the, is that a pigeon? What is that, man? Is it a pigeon? It's a, it's a fancy meme, apparently. He's got a Beretta, right? You know, he's, he's wearing the, the, the vestments and everything, the trad vestments. And so, yeah, D David Haleva, you can find him in there if you have any questions or comments. Uh, make, sure to, make sure to encourage the guy. It was really, really awesome. This, I, I believe is his first solo video like this. And so uh, it's a real honor, and I'll, I'll make sure to share this individually as well. Uh, of course, it'll be made available to all of the, the members, but I, I'm going to talk to uh, Tim and make sure that I can just share it individually on Meaning of Catholic as well as the, the, full, uh, the full video there of Nicaea that we'll, sh uh, we'll show after this. So with no further ado, with no further ado, the premiere of my boy, David Haleva, with his, uh, with his first reflection on the first week of Advent. Ave Maria, my name is David Holeva, and I am a new contributor to Paleocrat Diaries. Uh, and you may recall, I did an interview with Jeremiah last month on the topic of St. Teresa of Avila's method of mental prayer, which I hope was edifying. Um, and we will reference prayer in uh, this coming talk. Um, but I just wanted to state that I'm really excited to be joining the Paleocrat Diaries team. Um, there's a lot of excitement around some of the new contributors, and I'm happy to uh, share uh, with you all the fruits of my prayer and the fruits of my learning. And hopefully uh, God blesses it and is able to uh, edify everyone's, um, or at least everyone that's watching, uh, all of your pilgrimages towards our heavenly kingdom. And so... Today, we embark on our Advent journey. And Advent is a time for preparation in which we meditate on the incarnation of Christ. God takes flesh. It is one of the most amazing, well, it is probably the most amazing incidents in history where God takes the nature of his creation so as to reunite his creation to himself, which was lost by our own sinfulness. And considering this monumental fact, we as Christians should be very eager to go out and to tell souls um, of this beautiful reality that Christ has become man and draws all things back to himself uh, through his cross and his resurrection. But it begins here in the journey and it begins in Bethlehem where Christ, um, through the Blessed Virgin Mary, takes flesh and is born. And so how do we do this effectively? We are very excited. We have a zeal to go out there and to proclaim the good news. But how do we do this? And there's many, many means and everyone has a certain, um, I guess, charism or, you know, you have all these different uh, ministries out and about. But I think it would be prudent for us to return to the source, uh, return back to where evangelization all began. And 
I want to take these next four weeks of Advent to help us prepare for our going out into the world and proclaiming the good news by looking at how Mary, the Blessed Mother, evangelized the message of Christ's coming through uh, the mysteries of the Annunciation, the Visitation, and the Nativity. And so over the next four weeks, we'll look um, at these mysteries in certain depth and draw out different lessons and conclusions for us to draw upon uh, and for us to internalize and maybe um, to become the hands and feet of Christ that we're all called to be. Um, it's important that we do that. Um, if you consider the fact that, uh, you know, you can, you consider the exposure that priests have to their congregation, right? Um, they have an hour uh, to do the liturgy um, every Sunday. And these days, priests are, are restricted to maybe five, ten minute homilies at most. And then you have maybe two or three minutes, two to five minutes, perhaps, in the confessional every two weeks, every month or so. Um, and then above that, if anyone is, is desirous of, of spiritual direction, you know, they'll get some more time with uh, with a priest. But priests really, that's the extent. That's that's about as much time as they get to impart the faith onto us. Um at least from a, a human standpoint, I'm sure their prayers uh, are so much more efficacious than we even realize. But um, we are the ones as laity that go out into the world um, and proclaim the gospel. And so we uh, should be uh, capable and have the tools uh, ready to evangelize the world. So let's now turn to the Blessed Mother and start reflecting on these beautiful mysteries. And so week one of Advent, I wanted to look at the Annunciation. At the moment of the Annunciation, the Archangel Gabriel tells Mary that the Holy Spirit will come upon her and that she will bear a son. And before Mary gives her fiat, before she gives her consent, the angel gives her uh, additional information. Namely, that her cousin Elizabeth has conceived a son in her old in her old age, and I'm not I'm, I'm here quoting from uh, Luke's account in, in chapter one, verse uh, thirty six. Uh, Elizabeth uh, has conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren, for with God all things. For with God, nothing will be impossible. This uh, additional information has always been understood to be an assurance for Mary, affirming that, in fact, all things are possible with God, including the conception of Christ within her virginal womb. It is only after this that Mary says the uh, words that gave uh, her fiat, I suppose. Uh, it is only after this that she says, quote, Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. Be it done to me according to thy word. And these words express an act of her self-offering, her surrender of the entirety of her being to God's will, emptying herself to be filled with that of God. And so I wanted to take three I wanted to reflect on three points, three lessons for us to take out from the Annunciation, which we can apply uh, into our means for evangelization. So for one, the fiat. We must have our own moment of fiat. We must have our own personal Annunciation in which we can give consent to God to be wholly open to receiving the Holy Spirit to do with us as God desires. And here we don't speak of the sacraments uh, in which we receive the Holy Spirit most explicitly in baptism and in confirmation, but rather here we speak about the realization of the spiritual potential for the Holy Spirit to act within us and to use us as instruments of God. The Holy Spirit is received in those sacraments, and the question needs to be asked, 
to what degree do we cultivate the fruits of the Holy Spirit that dwells within us? Have we allowed the seed of grace within us to remain dormant? And if our potential remains unrealized, then what use are we to anyone? For people do not want us. Every soul clamors and clangs and desires God. And it is through the Holy Ghost that we need to let Christ work. So that Christ, as I believe, I believe it's uh, St. Therese of Lisieux. No, Saint, or no, St. Teresa of Avila says, uh, It is our hands and our feet that Christ walks and works um, in the world and in our time. And so we need to consent to the Holy Ghost to work within us. We need to be open. We need to give our own fiat. We need to be convicted that it is time for the Holy Ghost to uh, start his mission within us. Second, let's reflect on Mary's disposition prior to receiving and give receiving the Holy Ghost and giving her fiat. So the second point to consider is Mary's disposition prior to giving her fiat and receiving the Holy Ghost um, by uh, and Christ within her virginal womb. And let's look particularly at purity and humility. Like Mary, we must make ourselves um, scrolls upon which God will write his plans within us. And this scroll must be spotless and there must be plenty of room within which God can write his divine plans. And this, uh, for us, is done through repentance, a pursuit of purity and living a sacramental life. So in modeling purity uh, and taking that lesson from the Blessed Mother, for she was without sin, and properly disposed to receive God. We hear in the Beatitudes, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. If we are lacking in purity and virtue, we cannot bear within ourselves a spotless lamb. For God, if he, wants, if he were to dwell anywhere, must dwell where... Uh, it dwell in a place that is properly disposed to receive him, i.e. somewhere without sin, uh, for, for sin is an abomination uh, to God. It is the rejection of God. And so uh, for us to think that we can have, for, for us to think we can contain God um, within us uh, in a state of sin is, uh, is a contradiction. How can we receive God if sin is a rejection of God? So it can; these two things cannot coincide together. This is further reflected um, in the Church's wisdom in our need to be free from mortal sin to receive our Lord in Holy Communion. Further, if we are in sin, we know that the uh, effects of it are a darkening of the intellect, and um, the fact that the flesh becomes the master of the will in many ways, and any possible inclination of the Holy Ghost uh, is tuned out by the raging passions. And as such, purity and, mas and mastery over our passions makes us predisposed to act with an elevated nature, and not one that is rooted in the things of the earth. The early church fathers attribute many images um, and symbols to the Annunciation. And one in particular, um, which I gave allusion to previously, is that Mary is a blank tablet upon which God, as the Logos, the Word, inscribes himself onto her. And echoing Psalm 40, verses 8 and 9, Lo, I said, see, I come with an inscribed scroll written upon me. I delight to do your will, my God. Your law is my inner being. 
The idea is that ourselves as a scroll must be clean and presented and presentable to God to receive his word, to receive his instruction. So that's purity. Now let's look at the other side of that, humility. Humility is the setting aside of ourselves, of our own will, to become vessels for God and that we may be filled with God and to do his holy will. So we look, we can look to an example of our Lord and our Blessed Mother as perfect models in humility. Our Blessed Mother, with her fiat, proclaimed herself to be the handmaid of the Lord and said to the angel, let it be to me according to your word. Furthermore, Christ's forerunner, St. John the Baptist, who we will talk about at length uh, in future weeks, proclaims that he must increase, I must decrease. And finally, within the liturgy, we hear it said uh, of our Lord that his body and blood were broken and poured out for us and for many. Are we ready to make such a sacrifice of ourselves? to be broken and poured out, to be the presence of Christ in the world, just as bread and wine become the body and blood of our Lord by the power of the Holy Spirit, so too will we be transformed by the Spirit if we make of ourselves an offering similar to that as is made on the altar. We must set aside our desires, our plans for that of God. For if God wanted something so simple as bread and wine to contain himself entirely and to what ends, the beautiful end of, of feeding himself to us, to give us life in himself out of such such simple instruments bread and wine and what you know we can consider what then could be said of us who are made in his image and likeness if we only consent to be transformed by the holy ghost and so we covered point one we must have our own annunciation we must give our own fiat two we discuss purity and humility and finally, let us look at prayer. The three mystical biographers of the Blessed Mother, I'm not sure of the three, but three that I've come across, St. Maximus the Confessor, Venerable Mary of Agreda, and Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich, all reference a pre-announcement, which was a prayerful preparation uh, by Mary to receive news. Uh, Mary of Agreda uh, particularly recounts Mary's nine days of prayer, which she undertook in preparation. Furthermore, all three of the biographers paint the scene of the Annunciation, noting that Mary was deep in prayer when the angel came to her. These references to prayer affirm to us the importance that it is by prayer that we will come to know the will of God in our lives. Nothing begins without a prayerful disposition, without placing ourselves in a position to receive the word of God and to allow God to inscribe his plans into us. You can reference uh, my interview with Jeremiah on the Meaning of Catholic Channel, um, where we discuss how to enter into mental prayer. But note that it is so critically important that we do this. We can uh, live a sacramental life. We can have purity, but we can never begin unless we're given instructions, right? We can, we have to, by prayer, present our scroll to God and give him the time and give him the space within which to write his plans. And so brothers and sisters, let this week one reflection help us to uh, do the background work to evangelization. As we note in the work, uh, Soul of the Apostolate, nothing can be done nor should be done without first beginning with prayer. 
And so let us take these three points. We must make our own fiat. Two, to be pure and to be humble. And three, to be rooted in prayer to receive our instructions. Let's take these, let's internalize them in this week. And as we journey through Advent, let us root ourselves in these things and make ourselves ready to evangelize this beautiful mystery of the incarnation of Christ. And I'll sign off in the same way that Jeremiah does at the end of every show. Never give up, keep on smiling, and memento mori. All right. Look at that. Look at that. Don't you love that guy? I know I do. You know, and look, he's a, he is a card-carrying member of Team Tiny Dancer. You know, we have a couple of those. We've added a couple of them that have a special connection with Samantha, right? A special connection with my daughter that for whatever reason, God has placed it upon their heart and in their mind, she, she comes up now and again in times of prayer, in times of reflection, in times of great need that they think about her. And in fact, I can I can say this, and I won't I, w I won't show the picture today, uh, but he has he has not just one, he's gone an extra level, he's gone an extra level, and he's added two pictures of Samantha at his workstation in Canada. What an amazing what an amazing thing! And in fact, they're not just two pictures. One of them is the ever popular "Never Give Up, Keep On Smiling" picture that was used by Make a Wish, but the other one is quite possibly my favorite of just her, right? I have ones that are my favorite of the two of us together, stuff like that, the Sammy Maya stuff. But but of just her, where she's behind that ice cream cone. And she's behind, she's got she's got this ice cream cone, mint chocolate chip, and it's so colorful and so bright. And she's bald. She has scars, right? Incision marks that are still, they still have scabs. They were brand new. She had only been out of out of surgery for a short period of time, the stitches were still in. You can see them in the picture. And she's looking out from behind this, this ice cream cone kind of halfway. And she's got this little smile on her face and a twinkle in her eye like she knows something that I don't. And I've come to the conclusion that she did. I think she was sagacious. I think that she was years ahead of her time. And I'm always moved, deeply moved, whenever people reach out to me and just they, something has been impressed upon them so powerfully that they felt compelled to reach out to me and say, Jeremiah, there's something about your daughter. There is something about your daughter. And anyone who's familiar with the show, even the pink at the bottom of the screen, even the, the shield behind me, the sign off, never give up, keep on smiling and remember that we're gonna die. The very, very, very end that says, uh, I wanted people to dream bigger thoughts with her face on it. The idea that we dream bigger thoughts, that we figure out what we love and we do it with all of our might. Those are themes that, you know, they're not original to her, but in my lifetime, it was, it was, it was my daughter, Samantha, that, that really helped to uh, ingrain that deep within me. And that exper those experiences that we had, the highs and the lows that we had, both during her life and after her passing, really helped to solidify those things inside of me. To, to be part of everything that I do. I've told people I'm even sitting in that place right now where my daughter, her heart beat its very last time. So that's, I've made this place my home. I've made this place where all of my creativity and all of my work that I pump out into the world, whether it's the videos, whether it's audios, whether it's editing pictures, whether it's writing my book, whether it's writing poetry, no matter what it is, it's the creativity station. And I found it in her heart, in the place where her heart was beating, even in those terrible and tragic times. And to say, that's where it is. So when somebody reaches out to me like David has, right? And there, there's, it's a big deal. We actually called a family meeting about it. And I'm not even joking. <laughs> we called a family meeting and we talked about David. We talked about him. And I told the children of the conversations that we had and the things that, that uh, the, the way that Sammy has, has impacted his life and her story has impacted his life. And I, and I said, we need to make a decision and they said, Team Tiny Dancer, Papa, he's in. And so, you know, people who support Team Tiny Dancer, that's one thing. It's another thing when there's a family meeting called. <laughs> and, and, they, and we say, nope, he's, part, he's in. He's in, he's in, he's in, he's part of the family. And, and that, that came with something that he, could t he would tell you 
was extremely painful. He witnessed a video. He witnessed a video of Sammy's last days, a cinematic video that I made. It's about six minutes long, and it's in four parts. It's in four movements. One, the the uh, taking her in a coma after she went into a coma and making the decision that our family would be Team Tiny Dancer forever, taking her on a gurney out to an ambulance that would drive her back home where she would die. The second movement, uh, placing her in, not only in, in a bed where our cat lion, she it was one of her last things she ever said. In fact, it was. <laughs> she said, I want to go home. And she said, I, I, I want to see lion. I want to see Coco. Lions are, are a big, fat, orange tabby cat. <laughs> and she loved that guy. She, and, he, and he loved her. And she wanted to see him. And we knew what that meant. She was done. She, wanted, she, was, she was okay to die. She was not afraid. And she knew she wanted to go home to do it. So that night she went into a coma, brought her back home in that ambulance, the, the motorcade. There's a, a video of the motorcade that was there. Uh, and we get home and the cat just jumped right away. Nobody had, to, nobody had to do anything. The cat just jumped on the bed and was just licking her hand, licking her hand, licking her hand. And he just wouldn't stop. And it shows that. It shows my son Athanasius, that second movement, shows my son Athanasius looking down at her, seeing her in this state. You can see the labor breathing and and processing this, what he's witnessing. And then suddenly, you know, at reflecting, and I, there's flashback moments I've included in the video that he finally just lunges backward and he wraps his arm and he starts playing with her hair and he kisses her cheek. Movement number three is me carrying her and her body out of the house. The family preparing her, painting her nails for her, combing her hair for her, and me step by step carefully, as gracefully as I could, carrying her in my arms out to the gurney, to the hearse outside our home. And the fourth, the family and our nearest and dearest friends standing around. You've heard this story. He saw it. That's why it required a family meeting. <laughs> it required a family meeting. And it's just, it's one of those things. You know, it's one of those things. And so it's, it's you know, I'm really grateful for him. I'm grateful for him as a man. I'm grateful for him as a Catholic. I'm grateful for him as a contributor. But most of all, I'm grateful for him as a friend and as a card-carrying member of Team Tiny Dancer Forever. And I'm proud that he has a picture, pictures, plural, of Samantha at his workstation in Canada. I'm proud of that. And so thank you so much for that. We, we all of us, I know that, I know I appreciate it. You know, I, I edit these things. I go through and I edit them, put music with them or intro stuff and, and everything else. And, uh, and I'll work with anybody who works with us, you know, any contributor that we have, I'll work with them, even on things like lighting, positions of cameras, uh, audio, things like that, so that they can begin to to build that craft even for themselves, that no matter what they do in their lives, that they would have those skills necessary to continue marching forward and doing what they love to do and to be better at it, better and better and better as time goes on. And I'm willing to work with everybody. And so I'm, I'm really grateful. Uh, I'm really grateful for him. All right. Before we, we move into uh, the section to do with uh, Father Lassance, right? So this first hour is just being dedicated to people who contribute, all right? I, I want to prioritize them. And I, I'm glad that you're along for this ride. I'm glad you're along for it. And I hope you're proud of these guys. And we're, we're interested even in, even, especially in some ladies, right? I'm going to start, I want to start blending in stuff. I want to, I want to talk to Haley. I want to talk to Haley and say, look, you know, you do these videos on your channel of, of rosaries and stuff like that. I would like to incorporate more things like that into this. And it doesn't, you don't have to host a show like the other guys, you know, if you're not comfortable doing that. But I would love to, to incorporate more, not just men, but women, right? Women coming in, women talking about these issues. And so if you're interested in that sort of a thing, I would say you can reach out to me. Of course you can, paleocratdiaries at gmail.com. But I would say even more especially, go and download that free app, Telegram, even if we're the only reason you do it, okay? You're the, it's the only reason. You'd be able to connect with me in a DM. You'd be able to connect with me by video chat or phone call, and you'd be able to join in and be part of the contributor group because any contributor to the website, any contributor or moderator or admin uh, to what we do here is also part of that. That's their membership fee. They don't need any membership fee. They get all of the background material and they get the conversations even on how to, to help establish themselves outside of what they do here. And so that's part of that. 
And so I just want to thank them. But this right here, this is, uh, I divided it into two, into two parts, <laughs> okay? And the first clip, it's, a little, it's longer than the first one, okay? But this is excellent. This is, uh, this is my boy, Jake Fowler. He's going to be talking about the Council of Nicaea and some of the, giving us some, some definitional uh, takes on this. And he talks about the glad trads, even mentions the Kaiser. Although he, I, I have to forewarn everybody, he does for a moment indulge in an extraordinary, extraordinary form of fake news by talking about this mythological unicorn called Central Standard Time. <laughs> There's no such thing. <laughs> we don't believe in that here. There is no such thing as Central Standard Time. That's fake. That is fake. And all time is Kaiser Standard anyway, so it doesn't really matter. So, but th this is an excellent intro. So, you know, some people, they might say, well, I know a lot about that, but a lot of people don't. And this is for the Johnny Q and the Sally Sue. So, you know, I mean, that, that's one of the reasons why we have folks like Tim Flanders. Tim Flanders is deep dive central on stuff like this. And, you know, including his book, by the way. If you haven't gotten the book, you got to go do it. Uh, it's, I've, I've heard nothing but rave reviews. Um, I'm still awaiting. I have not, I have not gotten uh, a book that I'm supposed to be getting to give away on the show. Right? It was actually, it was actually donated by, by the, the admin over at our Paleo Radio connected channel over at telegram where music is posted you can follow the playlist there it's got youtube links to various songs throughout the years uh i would say it's like it's the best of all time right like so it's it's a, a wild mix an eclectic mix of music and phil is the guy that does that he he accidentally purchased two books so he's sending one to be given away as a prize on the show so we're going to go ahead and do that but I, i'm going to get my own copy i told tim yesterday i said look man i'll, I'll pay for it i don't i don't want it for free I said, I'll pay for it. I support what you do. And uh, you support what I do. <laughs> you provide a platform, bro. Trust me, I'm, we're good. And so, um, and plus, he's my boy anyway. But I, I did tell him he's got to sign it. I'm not paying extra for that. <laughs> and, so, and so, very, very grateful for that. But, um, but if, you know, so if that's what you're into, that's what you're into. But if you're somebody who says, look, I want to know and follow this. Because it, it's not just to talk about it. It's to say, we live in a time where everybody's talking about, you know, in the, tra in the tratosphere, People are always talking about Vatican II, Vatican II. And how, oh, look at the ambiguity, or it was problematic this, problematic that. He's going to go through and talk about the background and why there was confusion even after the councils. Why did the confusion persist? Why did some people take it like the Jansenists did to take the Council of Trent and to say, look, we're, we're in the, not only the spirit, but the letter? How could that, how could that be possible? So is this a new thing? Or is this just another example? And how would that affect how we view this and how we view our reaction to this in the world? I'm sure that it's going to rankle some rad trads and bad trads and sad trads. And of course, the very uh, cantankerous mad trads. That's perfectly fine because we here are glad trads and we are constantly having fun. <laughs> we're having a good, we're not constantly. It's tempered, right? It's tempered. Obviously, we've been talking pretty serious. And, and by the way, last, last, last thing I'll say about it. It's kind of funny. I, I did a... a um, patron only show yesterday with Tim. So did that. That's one of those things that anytime I do a patron only show with Tim, I make that available to our patrons. Uh, his patron only stuff that's unique to him. I don't, I don't share those, share those, but the off the record, the off the record uh, ones, I definitely share. And so we were in there and somebody in the comments was talking about, you know, oh yeah, well, Jeremiah seems like way laid back today. He's not, you know, going wild and growling into a microphone and stuff. What's going on with this? <laughs> and it's like, man, you got to be all things to all people. You know, I, I used to be on, on the show all the time as a contributor and I, you know, I didn't act that way. I'm even calmer in the morning on, uh, on the Terror of Demons morning show on Mondays. And so I'll be back on, on this upcoming Monday to talk about the state. So the Catholic view of the state. Um, it, and I'll, we'll debate that. Okay. We'll talk about that. So it's going to be a whole bunch of fun. That's in the continued series between myself and Kennedy Hall. Uh, I would have been there last Monday, but my kids were sick and they've been their first day back at school. Thank you for your prayers for my children. And, uh, but let's go right now. No further ado. Jake Fowler in his first solo video contribution to Paleo Crad Diaries. Hi there, it's me, Jake Fowler for Paleocrat Diaries. How are y'all doing today? I'm doing pretty well. It's actually nighttime here in Central Time. 
the only time zone that really matters. The paleocrat knows what I'm talking about. I've got my stout. I've got my mouse. I've got my outline. What are we doing? Well, a series on the ecumenical councils. It's important. Uh, as if there wasn't enough enthusiasm going around. We've got gross misunderstandings about councils and bishops and theologians. And what about the church? Is it really unchurched? Has the most recent council been the worst one? Is it going to destroy us? So we're going to look at that. We're going to do the opposite of what the Kaiser did. Instead of starting from the most recent and working our way back, we're going to start with Nicaea 1. We're going to start in 325, and we're going to march forward through time, God willing, Paleocrat willing, Tim Flanders willing. We're going to cover all 21 ecumenical councils. And so without further ado, get this music out of here. Here we go. We should begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So theology before the Council of Nicaea. After the Apostolic Age, the first few generations of the Church, theology really began to take shape. The speculation that was done by philosophers and theologians, people like Justin Martyr, Clement of Alexandria, Origen, they, lo they, they looked at um, the relationship of the Old Covenant to the New. They looked at the Mass, the sacraments to some degree. They looked at scriptures, priesthood, but the Trinity. That was really the key, the relationship of the Father to the Son, of the Father and the Son to the Spirit. This was what gripped the Church in those early days, right? Those early years, rather. The Word wasn't even in use, but Tertullian... Uh, actually, he was the one that gave us the term Trinitas, right? So it's a threeness within a oneness. But how to articulate that? How to come to this knowledge of three in one? It didn't just happen overnight. I mean, we, we tend to think of it, um, you know, as basic catechism. One nature, three persons. What's so hard about that? But it took hundreds of years for the church to come to this understanding. And along the way, there were mistakes made. There was uh, people who thought that Christ was some kind of angel. So that would mean that he's not God, right? He's a messenger, uh, but he wouldn't be the son of God, capital G, right? Then we had the Ebionites who believed that Christ was a prophet who earned the title son of God, but nonetheless remained a man. They kind of died out. One of the most pernicious heresies uh, in the early church was that of Gnosticism. Gnosticism embraced uh, a sort of dualistic worldview, right? There was a tension between matter and spirit. There was uh, naturally then two deities. There was the good God who created spirit and the evil God who had created matter in the material world. The evil God was the God of the Old Testament. He was the God of law, severity, justice. The good God, the God of spirit, the God of Jesus Christ, he was the God of the New Testament. Sort of like um, the one who came to liberate us from the old God. So you could see the dualism at play here. Now, there are two concepts from Gnosticism that will actually emerge later in uh, Orthodox Christianity, that's Orthodox small o. No offense, ortho bros, but y'all got it wrong, okay? So the two concepts that proceed, if you will, from Gnosticism are, coincidentally, procession and consubstantiality. In Gnosticism, they had this idea that God uh, was a monad at first, and he is alone in a divine and eternal silence. And from this divine and eternal silence comes word and life and truth and so on and so on and so on. And so there's this procession of divine beings, each one from the next. And then there's this consubstantiality. What is emitted from one is considered to be of the same nature as the one that emits. So in other words, God in his divine silence 
emits word and life, mind and truth. And these are considered also to be divine realities. Now, again, this is Gnosticism. This is a heresy. But the concept that some thing can proceed from another thing and retain the same nature I think you can see where I'm going with this. That's going to factor in to Orthodox Christianity in the 300s. Two main lines of thought regarding the unicity of God and the distinction of persons developed, right? And we're going to give them, there's going to be kind of a convoluted names, right? So you have, on the one hand, subordinationism, and then on the other hand, monarchianism. Monarchianism, common in the West, rather than the East, wants to preserve the oneness of God, okay? And so they underemphasize the distinction of persons. So the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, they are truly God, but are they one person or are they three persons? We don't really know because we're so concerned with the oneness of God. Think Deuteronomy 6, 4, okay? Think, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. That's the concern of the, the, the folks upholding this monarchianism. On the other hand, you've got subordinationism. This was the one more common in the East, not foreign to the West. And this idea wants to preserve the distinction of persons in the Trinity. So much so that the Son and the Spirit end up being subordinated to the Father. They must be different in some way. And so if they're different, then they must not be fully God. So maybe God the Father is God, capital G, but the Son and the Spirit are maybe like God in some way, still divine, but we're not really sure how that works. So they're subordinate. So there would be a hierarchy in God, just like we see a hierarchy in uh, the family and in creation and in the church itself. There comes a time, right about the 260s, so this would be after the Decian persecution of the middle of the 3rd century, where we've got these two guys. On the one hand, Dionysius of Alexandria, and on the other hand, Dionysius of Rome, the Pope. Dionysius of Alexandria, the bishop there, he taught that the Son was made by the Father and that he was of a different substance. So not consubstantial. And he said this is sort of analogous to like a farmer and his vine or a potter and the clay, right? The one sort of comes from the other, but they're not the same substance, right? Clearly the farmer wouldn't be the same as his vine and the potter the same as his clay. And Dionysius of Alexandria says that this is how we should understand the father and the son the Son, and the Spirit. This is a very good example of the subordinationism that I was just talking about. Common in the East, Alexandria's in the East, okay? Now, why was he going to this trouble? Why did Dionysius feel the need to preach and teach about this? He was responding to a heresy that had arisen in the West called Sibelianism, named after Sibelius, right? And Sibelius was a monarchian. In fact, he thought, that the Father, the Son, and the Spirit were just one person who had three different roles or three different modes. Hence, the term modalism is sometimes also used. So the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, they're really just one. And depending on which mode or which role they're fulfilling at the moment, that's the person or the persona that is represented or made manifest. So sort of like I am a husband, father, and brother, right? Or husband, father, and son, right? I have these same, uh, I'm, I'm, the, I'm one person with these different roles, okay? And that's what Sibelius believed regarding the Trinity. Dionysius knew that this was not true. And so in response, he wants to differentiate the persons so much as to subordinate the Son to the Father. Dionysius of Rome, the Pope, got word of this, and he intervenes. He corrects the errors. He writes against Dionysius of Alexandria, 
But he also writes against the Sabellians. He writes against modalism as a heresy as well. Dionysius of Rome says that it's not lawful to speak of the Son as having come into being, but only as having been generated. So here's the first instance that I'm aware of where we have coming into being not the same as being generated. So to come into being would seem to imply that there was nothing and then there was something, as if the Son were created ex nihilo, created from nothing. Dionysius of Rome says you can't think that. You can't hold that about the Son. We know he's eternal, but he was indeed generated by the Father. We could say that, and Scripture attests to this, but we can't say that he's come into being in any sort of way. As a side note, I just want to point out, again, Orthobros, this is a good example of early papal authority settling a dispute in a particular church in the East. Dionysius of Alexandria, in his reply to the Pope, doesn't question his authority whatsoever. He simply wants to point out, he says, Holy Father, I didn't say some of the stuff you think I said. So again, the judgment was considered to be binding and legitimate. And again, in his reply, Dionysius doesn't question the Pope. He just points out that maybe some of his views were mischaracterized. But the condemnation of his positions still stands. The condemnation of Sabellianism still stands. Before we move on, I think it's important to mention some of the terms that are in vogue in these days. All right. The Roman Empire, being the way it was, was very large, obviously, and there were roughly two halves. There was the Latin Western half and the Greek Eastern half. In the West, they spoke Latin. In the East, they spoke Greek. That should be pretty obvious. The Latins used some terminology uh, regarding the persons of the Trinity and the nature of God that the Greeks did not use. The Latins used substantia for nature and persona for person. Now, as a side note, again, a side note to the side note, Persona, originally in Latin, was uh, used uh, like as a mask, right? To sound through is the literal interpretation of that. Persona, to sound through. And so an actor in a play or something would wear a mask and he would take on a certain role and his sound would be coming through the mask, hence the term. And this is where the West sometimes gets accused of modalism or being too monarchian. Remember, that's an emphasis on the unity of God, the unicity of God, over and above the distinction of persons. In the East, on the other hand, the Greeks use the terms ousia for nature and hypostasis for person. Except hypostasis and ousia are very flexible terms. And hypostasis can mean nature or an individual subsistent thing or a personal existence. To add insult to injury, or rather confusion, I should say, Latin for hypostasis is substantia. So if I haven't confused you, let me see if I can do it a little bit more. Substantia was nature in Latin, substance. Right? So we have one divine substance and three personae, if we were speaking in Latin. But substance in Latin translates into hypostasis, which is person in Greek. So if the Latin theologians spoke about and wrote about one substance, it could be misunderstood to mean one person. Hence, the Greek opposition to modalism, Sibelianism, again, that was previously condemned as a heresy. Likewise, on the other side of the coin, if Greeks said three hypostases, Latins could understand that to mean three natures. Three natures would mean three gods. That's polytheism. And this was one of the chief reasons why Latin theologians were more monarchian 
than their Eastern counterparts. They were faced with all kinds of paganism in the West from various tribal peoples in Western Europe and in Northern Africa. And so in order to preserve, again, the unicity and the unity of the Godhead, they erred on the side of modalism, although not going that far. So it's basically, it's a muddled mess. We have no consensus, East and West. We've got differing terms that lead to confusion. And we've got persecution. So about 40 years after the controversy between the Dionysus, Dionysus, we've got Diocletian. Diocletian, the Roman emperor, rises to power in about 284, okay? And he's a pretty chill guy until around 298, 299, where Christians start to get under his skin. And in fact, his Caesar, Galerius, was an ardent pagan. He was a devout pagan, if there is such a thing. And he did not care for Christians one bit. And while the Roman Empire was busy divining omens and all sorts of other things that pagans do, um, Galerius wanted very much to scapegoat the Christians. And so when these pagan rituals weren't quite going as planned, he kind of points out to Diocletian, hey, maybe it's because these Christians are standing right here. So that kind of gets Diocletian thinking, well, maybe I need to do something about this Christian problem. So he initiates a persecution. It doesn't last long, but it is very violent. So adding to the mix of the, the, the non-consensus in theology, the confusion in terms between Latin speakers and Greek speakers, and Christian persecutions, we've got a recipe for disaster. In 305, Diocletian retires, one of the few Roman Empire emperors to retire. A lot of them were killed either in battle or through political intrigue. He's replaced by Constantius Chlorus. This is the father of who we know as Constantine the Great. Constantius Chlorus ruled from about 306 until 312 when his son, Constantine, rises to power in the West. In the East, meanwhile, we have Constantine's counterpart, Licinius, who defeats Maximin, who was Augustus in the East at that time, or again, around 312. And so now we have Constantine in the West, Licinius in the East, and they agree, unlikely, but it happened, to make Christianity a legal religion. 280 something years since the death and resurrection of our Lord. And finally, Christianity is a legal religion in the Roman Empire because of Constantine and Licinius. In 313, they promulgated the Edict of Milan, which achieved this very purpose. So things were looking pretty good, except Arius. About five years later, 318, 319, somewhere in that neighborhood, Arius starts to get very bold. Arius was a priest of the Diocese of Alexandria in Egypt. He was an older man, tall, austere, and he was the pastor, well, we would say he was pastor, he was assigned to a very wealthy parish uh, called the Bacchalis, I'm not sure what that translates to. And he had a lot of influence. He had friends at the imperial court. He had friends who were bishops. They were trained under the same theologian, whose name was Lucian of Antioch, by the way, he died in 312 as a martyr shortly before the Edict of Milan. Lucian was well respected. Unfortunately, we don't have many of his works, so we don't know exactly what he said and did and taught. But we know he had some notable pupils. Arius, for one, Eusebius of Nicomedia, a bishop, Eusebius of Caesarea, another bishop, among others. So Arius is a pretty sharp guy, and he sees that the relation between the father and the son is not 
quite as well defined as it ought to be. And so he undertakes this task. He's been well trained, after all, by a very well respected theologian. Uh, and so Arius' theology runs like this. Referring back to Deuteronomy 6, he said, God is completely transcendent. The Lord is one, right? He carries that forward from the Old Covenant. Therefore, because he's one, he's utterly distinct from anything else. He's incapable of sharing his nature, and he's fully perfect in every way. Uh, Cardinal Schoenborn, in a book called God's Human Face, puts it this way. He says, Arius is God is a lonely God, a lonely monad. It's just him in his divine silence, just God the Father. Creatures can't bear the full stamp of divinity, so God needs an intermediary. It couldn't be a man, because that would be impossible for man to bear. So more like an angel or a super archangel thing, sort of like Michael the archangel on steroids. This is the sun in Arius' theology. The sun is this thing, this super angel thing, through whom the Father creates all other things, right? In Colossians, as a matter of fact, it refers to Christ as the firstborn among all creatures. Arius points to this, and he says, look, here's an example of what I'm talking about. The Son is a creature. He's created, and all other things flow through him, okay? In John chapter 1, uh, it says that, all of creation was made through the word. Without him was made nothing that was made. And so again, Arius points to this and says, well, we know he's a creature based on Colossians. We know that all creation flows through him based on John 1. He must have been generated by the Father. He must have been made. And if he's truly the Son, then the Father would have preceded him to some degree. And so there was when the Son was not. That's sort of an awkward phrase, isn't it? To say there was when the Son was not. We, we naturally want to say there was a time when the Son was not. Or there was an interval. Or there was a moment. Or something like that. But all of those have a reference to time. And time is created. There couldn't have been time before the Son created time. So Arius is left to say, there was when he was not. Because again, he wants to preserve the divine simplicity of the Father, the sovereignty of the Father. He is Cardinal Schoenborn's lonely monad, okay? Or I should say, Arius's lonely monad, as described by his eminence. Now, there's a contradiction here. I'm sure you've already spotted it. If God is so utterly distinct from all creatures that he needs an intermediary, and that intermediary is also a creature, then how is it that the intermediary can bear the stamp of divinity, but the rest of creation can't? Hmm. I don't know if Arius thought of an answer to that. At the end of the day, Arius subordinates the Son to the Father. He must be considered inferior to him who was before, to him who was not made, who was not generated. And so the Son is less. He may be God, small g, but he's not God, capital G. It wasn't long before this theology started causing problems for Arius. I mean, you can understand how, if after all these centuries, almost three centuries now, the church has been praying to Christ as God, offering the Mass through him, with him, and in him, how are we now suddenly saying that he's a creature? How are we worshiping him as God if he's not? Arius' bishop, Alexander of Alexandria, he gets word of this, and he writes and teaches against Arius. He corrects him. He says, Arius, your position is untenable. You can't hold this. This is not the faith 
of the church. And he holds a diocesan synod at which Arius is condemned. But due to his connections, the problem doesn't go away. I mentioned he has friends at court, at the imperial court. Eusebius of Nicomedia, you see, his old chum from school under Lucian of Antioch, he's got the ear of Constantine. Constantine is in residence at Nicomedia while Constantinople is being built. And so Eusebius of Nicomedia is the bishop with the closest contact to the emperor. The empire was beginning to be in turmoil over this question. How did it spread so quickly? How is it not just a localized issue in the Diocese of Alexandria? Well, Arius, he was a clever fella. I mentioned that. He was crafty. And he composed these songs. And he distributed the songs. Alexandria is a port city. He distributes the songs to sailors. He teaches it to them. And these songs, these hymns, as it were, are full of Arian theology. And they're catchy, apparently, because they spread like wildfire. And pretty soon, all over the Roman Empire, wherever these sailors go, people are singing these songs. And so now they're confused. We thought Christ was God. Well, it's easier to understand if he's a creature. But we've been praying to him as God. And so again, this is causing tension. This is causing turmoil. And here we thought the legalization of Christianity was going to make just for one, you know, uh, sunshine in rainbows, I suppose. Constantine sees that this is a problem. He recognizes that religious unity is key to political unity. It always has been. It always will be. Right? Fast forward in your mind uh, over a thousand years. Think about the Thirty Years' War, the wars of religion in the High Middle Ages, in the early modern period. Religious unity is key to political unity. So this conflict is unacceptable. It's going to make Rome susceptible to enemies within and without. The emperor wants to stay right with God. That's one of his chief goals, right? He considers it his duty to make sure his kingdom follows the Lord God. Even though he himself was not a Christian, he was maybe a catechumen. I don't think you could even say that. He was fond of Jesus. So let's put it that way. It was Jesus whom he believed helped him become emperor, right? He sees a sign in 312 at the Battle of Milvian Bridge when he defeats Maxentius to regain, or to gain, rather, the throne. And so he knows that there's power behind this Christus, but he's not quite there. He's not baptized. All the same, he understands that this is important. And so he does what anyone else would do. He calls a council. In part two, we're going to look at that, say, that same council, Nicaea 1, which convened in 325. We'll look at what happened to Arius, who may or may not have punched him, and the aftermath. And we'll try to take it a little bit at a time. We'll try to learn from the past so we can apply it to the present. I'll tell you, I had a lot of fun. I'm sitting here by myself. I'm talking to you. I hope you had fun, too. I hope you had a beer with you. I don't care what time of day it is. I want to thank my man, Jeremiah, for this opportunity. And again, Lord willing, basket weaver willing, Tim Flanders willing, there will be many more. As you can see on your screen here, I almost forgot. Don't forget to go to paleocratdiaries.com, read my article. It's about death, dying, and the holy souls in purgatory. Uh, when I told my wife the title, she said it was just like me, exactly like my personality to write about death. So don't let her down, folks. Go read it. Let her know that she was right. All right. Until next time, never forget, never give up, keep on smiling, and memento mori. I'm Jake Fowler for Paleocrat Diaries. See you next time.
Mm -mm. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. I love those guys. I love those guys. We're going to be seeing a lot more of them. And again, if you would like to contribute, make sure, reach out to your boy. You know, reach out to your boy. Let me know. We'll talk. We'll figure it out. I'll help you to, to learn how to set stuff up. You'll be able to keep to the style of all of this, kind of like I'm doing with the thumbnails. I got to do it, you know. <laughs> My thumbnails would be way, way cooler <laughs> if I could just do it myself. But I can't. And I won't. But make sure to reach out to me, paleocratdiaries at gmail.com. And of course, you can do the same thing by, it's even better if you just go over to Telegram and add Telegram as an app. Find Jeremiah Bannister, it's just one word, or at Paleocrat, or at the Wolfpack chat. And that's how you can connect with us. So right now, you're hearing the clarion call. Anthony Rodriguez, Haley, all of the admins, all of the mods, on top of their homes right now, outside on their porches right now, or in their cars, with a conch, with the didgeridoo, the shofar, blasting them aloud to let the world know that it's about to begin. We only have about 30 minutes to rock, so we're going to rock this out. We're going to do the best we can. We're going to be talking about Father Lassant and his manual today is the manual for young ladies. For young ladies. And by the way, I encourage everybody, join in the live chat. Join in the live chat. And for clarity, <laughs> for clarity, I have to say this. People in the live chat... I don't know about Telegram. I don't know about that. There are these other people that used it, these really controversial sensationalists that use it, who say things that are obviously, obviously things that will get them in trouble on YouTube. Obviously, without any hesitation, no, no worries about it whatsoever. They do that and they lost their channel. And I'm like, well, duh. That's one of the reasons I'm over on Telegram because I'm making videos on Telegram. I don't need to worry about that. I don't need to worry about it. And on top of that, I don't subscribe to <clears throat> you know who. Don't need to deal with that nonsense. Don't need to deal with that nonsense. Speaking of nonsense, somebody in the comment section <laughs> This comment section is nonsense. What the heck is going on with you guys? What's wrong with you? <laughs> somebody somebody was like, I'm losing the plot. Uh, plot of what? Of the, the, the show? No, of the chat. <sighs> You think there's like somebody, somebody is curating it and saying like, hey, this is the plot. Everybody stick to it. You guys aren't sticking to what's being talked about here. Why would, why would there be a separate plot to the chat? <laughs> it's just a rambling stream of conscious, consciousness. That's all it is. It's all it is, right? It's people just thinking out loud in real time, mixing and matching it up. Just smorgasbord of awesome stuff, right? So you'll have different people with different views in there. Talking about different things. Some people paying attention to one. Some people bringing up random factoid over here. <laughs> number two, right? Some people talking about <laughs> number three. Come on, man. <laughs> Come on. And look, as a reminder, as a reminder, somebody, you know, I, I, I commented, and sometimes I get flack over dumb stuff. Like, like I think it's just argumentative folks, you know, that, that I can say something like, yeah, I, I'm not controversial. I'm not talking about controversial stuff. And they'll be like, well... You know, and, and look, I, this this cat, well, this wolf, <laughs> white wolf, uh, you know, I, I, I appreciate the presence of the white wolf in there every single week. But I, I'm using this as just an example. No, take no offense. Trust me. Um, you know, but to say uh, I don't talk about controversial stuff. Right. I mean something by that that I think should be pretty obvious to anyone who's paying attention to what I'm saying on the show. In our day and age, that's extraordinary. Nihil uh, the, the nihilism that pervades our, our secular age. It is controversial to talk about virginity. It is controversial to say to avoid pornography. It is controversial to say, stay true to your husband, stay true to your wife. It is controversial to say, don't do the, you know, stuff to yourself to pleasure and stuff. Controversial to say that stuff. We talk about that. However, we are not ambulance chasers. We do not talk about current events. That, that, that lands people into a different world, right? You talk about current events, I've done it. You talk about current events, your job almost inevitably is to get online and look for news that makes you mad. To look for news that is going to rile people up. And so you find really controversial stuff. And 
you do this extraordinary thing, right? It, it's it's almost it's tiptoeing on this idea that that you're like, you know, you're, you're you're so consumed in union with God that whatever you say, it's just it's just infallible. That when you when you comment in real time, let's say a story comes out in the morning, right? Story comes out in the morning. It's in the morning news. You wake up bright and early. You're checking the news for all that stuff that makes you really mad, and you're like, oh my gosh. I can't believe this happened. I'm going to talk about this. And then you get on there and you're in real time and you're pontificating off the cuff. You're pontificating off the cuff. I mean, what what, what kind of magic mind do you have there, brother man, to be doing that? And to not think that you're going to say maybe some stuff that's nonsensical or stuff maybe you ought not to say. Stuff that maybe you got to retract and take back. I got in a conversation with this, you know, and I, I like these guys. I mean, there's nothing wrong. You know, I'm, I, I've uh, had a Twitter conversation with one of the people there, and I'm, I'm personal friends with another uh, on a show. I won't even say the show, right? It's a very popular traditional Catholic show. And there was, a, a, there was a, a forecast. I'll put it that way. I won't even say prophecy, although basically yeah, a, a forecast that we are going to have martial law in September. I was in the comments when that happened, said, dude, don't do that. <laughs> don't, don't do that. And, and people got mad at me. Well, you know, it's possible. Yeah, uh, okay. But what if it's not? You just riled people up, freaked people out, spreading around like crazy. Sometimes people don't appreciate what it means to be an influencer. They don't fully appreciate the gravity of that situation. And so it's just pontificating off the cuff. Fly by the seat of your pants with a bunch of wisdom 24-7. Every time you open your mouth, you think you're, you're profound. That's just it's phony baloney sauce, man. That's phony baloney. That, that's, that, that's a ridiculous assumption for anybody to have. And so what do we do here? We talk about books. <laughs> we talk about books we go through. We talk in the moment. We, re- we react to those. But I'll tell you right now, like enthusiasm, for example. Let me see if I got it. Yeah, of course I do. Enthusiasm, right? Big honkin' book, 600 pages. Read it four times. We read, read it three times in the process of doing the show. Three times. Sitting there, stick it, sticking with it and saying, look, in what ways do I disagree? This took, this took a long time. I did 20 episodes. How long was that, by the way? 20 episode series on that. You can find that here. Of course, and on Telegram, we have a, a pinned uh, message that talks about that talks, it lays it out chapter by chapter that I do in the order that I did it in, right? Starting with the beginning and the end, the, the nature and philosophy of enthusiasm, to know thy enemy uh, within and without. And then after that, we began at the end, we talked starting with the revivalists and worked our way all the way back to uh, the Corinthian letters. And so I started with those things that were most, most near and dear that we would understand even from our day-to-day existence and worked our way to show how what we're seeing here tracks back like what what jake said in the video where for him he's moving forward he's starting to say he's going to do the opposite direction he's going to start at the beginning and work his way forward to demonstrate that we're not just you know uh, we're not this isn't the first time this isn't the first time that there's been enormous amounts of confusion even after councils hubbubs and crazies and enthusiasts all over the place right but to go through and, and to to take your time on it to, to just allow it to kind of saturate, sit there for a while, appreciate it, meditate on it, reflect on it, and then later to talk about it. And to talk about issues that are really difficult. Because I mean, look, we talked, how did we get here? Where are we right now? What is this place, the secular age? How did we get to this place? What's the timeline for this? If, we're, if we got the God's eye view looking down at history and we say, okay, here's how it played out. Here are the different ways that this thing moved forward through history, the adaptations, the deformations, all of these things to lead us to this place where there's great confusion and tumult, where there's great despair and apostasy and say, how do we not only survive in that, but how do we thrive in that? And how do we confront the world? And if you don't think that's controversial, you know, you have a weird standard of what controversy is. And again, I'm not, I'm not, I'm using it as, as a a point of reference. I'm not going after the dude in in the checks. I, I always appreciate it, by the way. I always appreciate that. Uh, everybody in the comment, right? Although I do not, however, appreciate the idea that I interrupt every every uh, time someone tries talking on an interview, that I interrupt them and then go off for 15 minutes. That's absurd. <laughs> the interviews are only an hour long. 
Sometimes 45 minutes. And so what? So I talk three times? Give me a break. <laughs> Nonsense. <laughs> nice try. And look, and I'm the guy. Look, I know. I've heard of who you are, by the way. <laughs> I've heard of who you are. And I'm supposed to play nice. I'm supposed to play nice with you. <laughs> so just put a bunch of winky emojis behind that. <laughs> put a bunch of those. <laughs> So okay, we're gonna we're gonna go ahead. We're gonna switch over to scene two. We're gonna switch over to scene two. In fact, uh, I'm not even gonna show the chat because I I had it there earlier. Okay, I am, however, going to see if I can do this because I I I have it here uh, set up in such a way. I may I may just have to do it this way. Please tell me it's not gonna fill up the whole screen. No, there we go. There we go. So I'm gonna have to do this ridiculous thing again. Okay. So all right. We're talking about chastity, and and, and we, we've talked the last couple of weeks about things, you know, work and being a glad trad and other stuff, and a lot of that came from the men's guide. I've been mixing them up, because we're dealing with both the men's guide, which is this one, okay? So that's this one here by Father Lassance, and over here, talking about the woman's guide. It's a little bit, little bit smaller, uh, and it does not, sadly, it does not have the, the method of hearing mass, the indulgence to method of hearing mass, that is available inside the men's guide. I think that that is extraordinarily important. I, I use it myself uh, frequently, and I, I, it's very, very helpful. And so I made that available at the Wolfpack Resources on Telegram. It's one of the many channels connected, as well as, of course, as the Canine Brigade Book Club and the Wolfpack Prayer Chain, as well as the uh, Deacon Joe Spiritual Advice page and uh, even the Paleo Radio page where we have a bunch of songs that are laid out Stuff like that. And now we have an art one. We have, we have an art one. So we're going we're gonna to add that to the welcome bot. So when you join the Wolf Pack, you'll be able to see it. But at the Resource Center, uh, that's actually head up by uh, uh, David Haleva. I've been saying Haleva. Haleva. Uh, you can go over there and, uh, and, and find those resources. Okay. Chastity is the, the lily, the pearl of virtues, the most precious of all, the most pleasing to God. It is called the angelic virtue because it raises man almost to a level with the angels. This virtue enables man to avoid all impure, carnal, forbidden pleasure, okay? Uh, to rise superior to temptation, to remain chaste in thoughts, words, and actions. And I love how the, the thought, word, and deed, that's what we say here. That we, that we submit ourselves every day to, to Christ the King in thought, in word, and in deed. But what this does is it says that it allows us to avoid it and it enables us, this virtue, enables us to avoid impure, carnal, forbidden pleasures. And not only to that, but to rise superior to temptation, to remain chaste in our thoughts, in the things that we, we think and imagine, in the things that we envision, right? The things that we speak of, the things that we embrace, the things that we put into action. But he talks about how great is the charm which innocence lends to a child, to a young girl. So magical is this charm that it often inspires even bad men and libertines with awe and veneration. It's true, isn't it? When, when you see, especially, especially little girls, you know, you, you see, you see little girls and there's a, and, and, and young ladies, and there's a sense of, uh, there's a charm, there's an innocence about them. In fact, I knew somebody even in college, and, and this is rare, you know, sadly, but it's something that it's predictable as the morning sun that, uh, oftentimes ladies will go off to college and men will go off to college and find themselves in an environment where hypersexuality is happening, people are away from home, there's alcohol and drugs, and there's this expectation, this, this social pressure when you're surrounded by worldlings who are engaged in sin that you join them, right? It's this, it's this curious thing where on the one hand, it, it's a, a confirmation to them that they're okay, you're one of the group. On the other hand, there's a self-loathing involved. And it, will never, and it will never get released. I mean, it's never, it's never going to end up subsiding. Because there's a feeling of horror, of self-loathing that must seize upon the fallen maiden. And this is going to get a little personal here. But, you know, I, I, I remember back in high school, you know, I, I remember, you know, I'll, I'll never be able to forget the day where um, I was a fallen man. I was no longer chaste. I was no longer a virgin. And I remember. And I remember going home that night and I, I walked it. I, I was at my friend's house. I was, I was uh, staying away from home. 
I went into my friend's house and went to go take a shower. And I go, I go in the bathroom and I'm looking at myself in the mirror and everything was a little bit gray. Something had changed. It wasn't the same. And, and worse than that, it was something that I couldn't take back. Part of me wanted to. Part of me, of course, did not. Part of me wanted to continue with a gusto in that world. But there was something inside of me that in that moment when I looked at myself in the mirror and reflected on who I was, there was kind of a sparkle and a charm and an innocence that was lost. I saw it. And it was gray. What joy on the contrary. What sweet consolation must fill the heart of a girl who fully deserves the title of virgin. He talks about the body of St. Francis Xavier, who was the most ardent lover of chastity, was miraculously preserved from corruption for a long space of time. And he says that the reflection on this abounds in comfort for every chaste heart. By means of these miracles, God designs to show that even though the human frame does molder in the grave, he has power to raise it up and to clothe it with such brightness and glory as to make it shine like a star in the firmament. You know, and, and I, I like that he follows this up by saying, you know, am I just talking about the ladies who, who have made good on their promise, have made good on their chastity? Or is he including others? Is he talking about those who, per, who persevere in battle? Or is he including others? And I, I, I think it's great that he brought up uh, uh, St. Francis Xavier because... And the idea of, of the preservation of a body that even though it was in death, that it was being preserved, um, that because he'd already died, he'd already died, he'd already experienced where the body is shut down, the brain is shut down, the heart is shut down, the blood would be still. Normally it would be followed by, by things that are quite gross. They do not make for a very aromatic environment. And yet here God is, even after that death, preserving it with a kind of sweetness. And I think that that's something there to say, look, you know, how many of us have fallen? And not just with chastity. I mean, we're focusing on that. But how many of us have, have fallen and done stuff that we truly, truly regret? That we wish we hadn't done. That, that we, we think, man, this really mars me. This, this makes me, I'm not worthy. And that's true. That's true, you weren't before either. I mean, it was grace that kept you there. And yet at the same time, we can, we can with great confidence and joy and consolation realize that God's going to take care of business. He has the power and the interest. But if, 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 a, if a maiden falls, right? If a lady falls uh, and, ends up, and, and ends up sacrificing that great pearl, right? Must they on this account give everything up for lost? Most assuredly not. There will always remain a certain blemish. That's true, isn't it? It's totally true. The woman who has fallen may become a penitent, but after the sincerest and most complete amendment and the severest penance, she must always bear about with her, uh, with her the identical body, the same soul, which have been made a shipwreck, right, of their innocence. And have been for a time a temple of idols, the abode of the spirit of evil. And I like the way that he phrases it because in the secular age, we've kind of boiled it down to just, well, you had sex. Flesh on flesh, right? That sort of a thing. In the heat of the moment, the sweat of the moment, that people talk about it that way. And yet for a while, not only did you make a shipwreck of your soul, but more than that, for a time you were a temple of idols, you were an abode of the spirit of evil. It was more than just flesh and blood. It was more than that. And you allowed yourself to become that. And I think that it's lost so often that, that you know, it's like, well, yeah, you did this physical thing. But we have to realize the spiritual dynamic to it because in the end, it's far more important. It's far more important. That would, be, that would be connected more intimately with those things that do not pass away. Yet even after so grievous a fall, there's some consolation left. Don't give way to despair. Don't, don't, if, if you're somebody who's gone through this, you're somebody who, you know, may, maybe in, in that moment you were weak. You were charmed by somebody. 
and you ended up doing something, you know, maybe your friends have talked about it and they've said how great it is and, and maybe you saw something on TV. Whatever it was that led to that moment, you found yourself in, in a place of great weakness and vulnerability and you didn't run. You didn't flee. And by run, I'm, I'm dead serious, like actually run. Where you say, I am not sticking around for this. I'm out. I'm gone. You know, we, we people say flee evil and stuff. Like, like, I would applaud the woman. In fact, I would say that she is the, the woman who would do that, who in that moment would sit there and get out and book it as fast as she possibly can to flee as fast as possible to get back to that safe harbor. That woman is an example for all. Like Joseph in the Old Testament. You might be made fun of. You might be lied about. But you wouldn't have been a temple of idols. You wouldn't have been an abode of a spirit of evil. Your case is then like that of a soldier who upon one occasion ran away from the enemy. Retrace your steps. Fight bravely. And then you may perhaps be more pleasing to God than those who, nev- uh, who have never taken to flight because they have never been called upon to engage in severe warfare nor have had to resist any special temptations. Think about it. Think about it. Yeah, okay, in that moment, you didn't do good. In that moment, there was, there was a kind of cowardliness within you that said, I, I, need to, I need to run from the good. I'm going to cave in. I'm going to submit and subject myself to this wicked thing for a momentary pleasure. But the idea is you can come back with a gusto it's just one battle. It's just one, one engagement. Your life doesn't end there. It's like, it's like the person, I've said it before, you know, it's like the, the people, uh, you know, life is this journey and we're all on a sidewalk. We're all walking the best we can, right? And, and there's a crack on the ground and you trip and you fall. Or maybe you intentionally stumble. <laughs> you know, you're like, ah! You, you stumble on the ground for some stupid reason, right? A sin is always a stupid reason. And so you end up falling on the ground and you can make a decision, You can either get back up, recognize what you did is wrong, recognize the gravity of the situation, and that that will, in fact, to some degree or another, it will mark you. You may be left with a scar, and yet at the same time, you don't want to be Peter Griffin on the ground in that episode where he's he's got, he's like, "Ah, ah, ah," and it just goes on forever and ever and ever. You don't want to be that person either. Get up, march on. Keep going. Fight back next time. Fight back. And don't judge yourself according to people who, you know, may, yeah, you're right. Maybe maybe they didn't uh, fall. You know, I, I know people who didn't. I know people who waited. I know people who got married and they'd never been with a woman, never been with a man. There was something remarkably special about them. Even when I'd be around him in college, I remember this one girl, she was, uh, you know, people, she was extraordinarily attractive. She was a very beautiful girl, physically, right? So, I mean, if you're born with two fully functioning eyeballs, I mean, you're able to recognize that. I'm not meaning to be, you know, rude or anything. But, I mean, you're, you're recognizing, that, yes, this chick is super hot. A lot of guys are like, yo, baby, I want to wanna hook up with you. And she's like, nope, I'm, I'm, a, I'm committed. I'm remaining virgin I'm, until I get married, and that's just the way that is. And I'll tell you, there was something... Where, where there's something where it's like you're set apart in that regard, right? There's a, there's, there's a charm about you. There's an innocence about you. And you will be, in fact, the desire, whether good or bad, the desire of many men. There's something very special about that, empowering about that. And God's grace is within you in a, in a different way, if done for the right reasons. But no matter what, it's being done. And I saw that. I, and... and People could tell, you could tell. Now, she wasn't hardly ever at the parties, ever. She would, she'd go to prayer groups, Bible study groups, stuff like that. So that's what she would do. And you could tell. And in spite of repeated defeats, never give up to the enemy. Herein lies the secret of final victory. Persevere, whatever may be your circumstances. Persevere. 
Because victory we will win, fighting against sin, suffering and pain, heaven's bliss will gain. No, oh, hold on. Okay, yeah, so let me let me let me go back here. He talks about talks about a saying about 400 years after Christ there lived a girl, okay? In one of the great cities of Egypt, a virgin, I cannot call her for she was a notorious sinner. We have other words for that. <laughs> I won't say what those are. Driven by an unclean spirit, she left her parents when she was only 12 years old so as to be able to give up uh, to the free reign of her passions. Okay? For 17 years, she carried on her life of sin without, uh, with, uh, without the vengeance of heaven falling on her. It's one of those things a lot of people in the world, they say, well, look, I've done this. Look at me, I'm doing okay. I'm alive for one. No, if you look closely, they're not doing okay. They are not doing okay. The, the, mere, the mere fact that they are no longer chaste, the mere fact that they're no longer virgins, the mere fact that they're going to be LARPing on their wedding day. If they're not repentant of this and they go on their wedding day and they're wearing a white dress, they're LARPing. In fact, they're liars in front of the entire world. It's like a big, a big heap of, of trash covered in a white dress. For 17 long years, she lived in such a manner that when upon one occasion... A stranger asked her who she was. She replied, quote, If I were to tell you the story of my life, you'd be filled with such loathing that you would fly from me as from a serpent. If anyone had told this poor, miserable sinner in the midst of her evil life that when she had reached the age of 29, she would begin to lead the life of an angel, while yet in the same body which had been so stained and polluted by sin, and that for 47 years she would continue to lead this life, that she would shed floods of tears, doing ceaseless penance, mortifying herself in every way, allowing herself no pleasure or indulgence, but enduring this martyrdom for 47 years. If, I say, anyone had told her this beforehand, she would no doubt have laughed aloud. She would have imagined that a sorry jest was being made at her expense. But this notorious sinner became the renowned and holy penitent, St. Mary, of Egypt. Again, you know, some people, you know, I, I know too often, even in myself, you know, I'll, I'll look at the saints and their lives and stuff, and I'll, and I'll sit there and say, how can I possibly live like that? I mean, you know, these folks, they're committed 24-7, they live these remarkable lives and everything else, and there's this, this, this saintly perfection about them in a way, right? They're cut above the rest. They are literally, in that sense, holier than thou. <laughs> in that sense, right? Not because they believed that, but because they believed and acted rightly. But it didn't always happen from the get-go. Think of St. Augustine and think here of St. Mary of Egypt. Oftentimes it's easy to point out St. Augustine and sometimes, you know, women... They're, they're not sure, like, well, you know, they've got Mary Magdalene, for, for example. They've got right here, St. Mary of Egypt. And so you look at it. It's a remarkable thing to flee from that life and, and to realize that, that you're not alone. Maybe you've done all that. Maybe you lived the party scene. Maybe you were engaged in drugs and alcohol and everything else, and you were all involved in that, and you found yourself weak. You found yourself riddled with sin for many years, unrepentant, not even reflecting on it. And it isn't easy in this world. We're completely surrounded by it. You can't even drive down the street without seeing signs and billboards and everything else that are so scandalous. It is extraordinarily hard, these times of ours. And it's, it, there's a tendency to say, i got to close my eyes. And in fact, it would be quite good to do that more frequently. To close your eyes in prayer. To close your eyes in meditation. To close your eyes in reflection and remembrance. To close your eyes in an examination of conscience. To truly evaluate yourself. To recognize what you've done. But recognize you're not alone. And in fact, just because you've fallen into those sins, 
Just because you've caved and just because you're no longer chaste, you, you're no longer in that sense of, of, of virginal purity. You're no, you no longer have that claim anymore. It's, oh, it's, it's okay. It's unfortunate, but it's okay. And why? Because you have, you have saints like her. You have saints like, like him, like St. Augustine. You have saints, heroes of the church. Right here. Some persons assert it's too difficult to keep the commandments. You know, people, oh, no, it's just too hard. It's just too hard. I, you know, I, I'm in college. You don't understand. I'm in high school. You don't understand. Well, in some ways, some parents don't because some parents encourage that kind of a thing and say, oh, yeah, go, go off to university by yourself. Go off to university by yourself. I'm not going to call ahead to find if there's other people around you, I'm not going to call ahead to find out, you know, is there a parish by you that's strong or that you can be involved with this and you can have some kind of accountability. I'm not going to even worry about whether or not where you're going is a cesspool of sin and sexuality. Not even going to worry about that. Good job. You got accepted. You're going to get a degree. Yeah, a degree in poon. A degree in poon tang and drugs. And say, look, is that is that even what, what's the goal? What's the end of that? By the way, I'm talking to the ladies. I I, I know certain ladies are like, you know, I want to I want to get my degree in this, and I want to get my degree in that, and I want to get my degree in this. And when you talk to them about marriage, they say they want to have kids, and they 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 want to be able to be staying at home and take care of the children. <laughs> and you're like, then what are you doing? What are you doing right now? You're putting yourself out there in a way that that demonstrates that you do want something, you want a career. You're, you're closer to sex in the city than sex in a family. You are. I mean, that's just true. And look at the end result of that and take no, don't go any further than the creator of that TV show. I believe she's the one who wrote the books or whatever in the, in the beginning. To sit there and say how depressed she is, how she wishes she could take it back. Because now she's old, she's wrinkly and gross. <laughs> she's a wrinkly, gross old lady. And she's looking around, and she sees all these, other, all these other women who did not follow her path. They didn't have the glitz and the glamour. They weren't free to go to all the parties, to revel in all the, the concerts and everything else, the soirees. They didn't have that. They were at home cooking burgers and... and you know, macaroni and cheese for their kids. Hot dog and macaroni and cheese casserole for their kids. Kids are like, what, what, what is it tonight? It's macaroni and cheese and hot dogs. We've already had that. Well, then you make your own food. You make your own peanut butter and jelly. I'm making peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Oh, no, you don't. <laughs> That's the kind of life they've got. And guess what? Now they're older, just like the, the, the wrinkly hag. They're just like her now, Right? Death is, is hanging out by the door. And he's sitting by the door, crouched, waiting, saying, I'm coming for you. You're getting closer by the day. And the difference is, she doesn't have family around her. She's got herself a degree. She's got herself a career. She's got herself that money and that independence. I want to be able to be an independent person for this. And she had, she had all that stuff. And waited later and later and later and later and later into life. Her priorities were completely jacked up. She had tons of momentary pleasures. And now at the end of her life, she is sad and lonely and wrinkly. Practically given death butterfly kisses at this point. No offense to her. I mean, I, you know, <laughs> I don't want to push that too close. I mean, many years. Let's hope that she gets her, her act in gear, right? But people say it's too hard. You don't understand the modern times. Most of those people don't either. Most of those people are the ones, you know, dressing up in sweatpants and socks and slippers walking around to buy food at the store and then saying they're not sure why dudes ain't looking at him. Cut that out. The commands of God are not difficult in themselves. They appear difficult only because of the indolence and cowardice. Slothful sinners say that it is difficult to avoid occasions of sin. It's not very wearisome to lie for weeks and months in bed in compliance with the order of a physician. Yet this is done to recover health. It's a veritable martyrdom to submit to a painful operation. 
yet, yet it's undergone that life may be prolonged. And in time of an epidemic, one has to remain in seclusion to avoid contagion. And though this is irksome, it's gladly done. How far more willing ought we to be to make a sacrifice in order to escape eternal death? And that's the point, because at the end of the day, it's not how hard the commandments are. How hard is it that when, when old boy is coming up on you, and he's, he's obviously wanting to get, you know, mm, that stuff going on, how hard is it to say, I'm out of here? How hard is it not to be there in the first place? How hard is it to say, oh, you want to meet in the car in a parking lot? No, I, that's obviously, you just, you are really trying to get into my genes. You really are trying to do something inappropriate. Only people being inappropriate would do that. Well, I just want to talk alone with you. We can go to my house. Well, your parents are there. They can be in the other room. And you, you don't like talking to my parents? It's not hard to run. It's only hard because you and because of me, because we have that tendency that says, look, I, I, I'm going to go ahead. I'm just going to do, I'm, I'm going to do this. It feels good. Maybe it'll make me cool. Maybe people will like me. I'll feel loved. No, you will not. You will. You, you, it's, it's a facade in that, in that regard. And you've mistaken love and lust. You, you've allowed those two things to be combined in your head. And it's, it's a falsity. It's wrong. And it's going to devour you. How many, how many of you who have done that felt loved in that moment? You're like, oh man, yeah, this guy is all about me. And then in the end, that dude's not even the guy you're with. There's no reason why people have to learn the hard way. There's no reason. Not when you're Catholic. You choose to learn the hard way. You choose to because you're not following the sagacious advice of 2,000 years of church tradition and all of the years of divine revelation even before that. And that's on you. That's on me. I'll end with this one. Maybe I'll spend a minute here in the comments. However, may, however great may be the temptation, however, difficult it may sometimes appear to you to avoid this or that occasion of sin. Nay, though sometimes it may seem utterly impossible, though at a later period of your life, you may be so unhappy as to yield to temptation and incur disgrace, misery, and want. Never give way to despair. Never cease to believe in the grace and mercy of God. Do not suspend your belief. Do not suspend that heart of prayer. Do not suspend the idea that you are throwing yourself at the cross of Calvary. Never. If you find yourself in that place, if, if you find yourself for whatever reason, right, by obligation or by happenstance, you just so happen to find yourself in that place, do not be ashamed to run. If you're ashamed to run, who are you ashamed of? Are you ashamed of sin? No. Are you ashamed, you know, of, of, of anything? <laughs> like, what, it, what would it be? You would be ashamed of virtue. You would be ashamed of God. You'd be ashamed of yourself as someone who's, who is determined to do the right thing. In that moment, you show what you're ashamed of. You, you're ashamed to imagine a world where that person might, that person who wants to do naughty things with you, where that person who wants you to fall into sin that person who wants to, to put you in a place where you have to go back to confession. If you go back to confession, that person's going to think even worse. They're going to say, oh, what, you think what you did with me was wrong? So just say, look, I'm letting you know right away. <laughs> you really regret it because isn't that a hook too? Are you saying you regret it, but didn't you like it? Don't you care about me? Don't let them get that hook in there. Don't let him even get the hook because that's going to draw out a kind of sentiment, sinful sentimentality that goes, you know, well, it was really pleasurable. It did feel great. In that moment, I felt really connected with you. It's been kind of hard lately. My parents are being rude to me. My friends, you know, my, my boss at work is being rude. And this felt good.
If you don't let that person get that hook and you run away, they may look down on you, but they would also feel ashamed. There would be a, a, a very a very clear line between your life and your loves and your expectation, the, the way that you protect yourself in these times and the way that they behave. And trust me, it'll burn. It'll burn them. In fact, running from them may be the very thing that down the road leads them to run to the cross. And if you don't run, then that's going to give them all the more assurance. Well, you're a Catholic and she, she did that. You're a Catholic. He did that. Why, why would I have to go to confession? I should feel fine about it. A seared conscience. A misinformed conscience. They, 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 would, they would be completely deformed in their views. Completely whacked out. So do yourself a favor. Do your eternal uh, destination a favor. Do everyone in the world a favor. Do, the, do a favor for the guy. If you care for that person who's in that car and is trying to do that or in that room and trying to do that or on the phone and trying to get you to do that, for the love of that person, flee. Be that example for him. Be that example for her. Be the example. Because right now, we are at a loss for it. We are literally at a loss for it. More people talking about what's right and not doing what's right. If fierce temptation's waves beat high and threatening clouds obscure the sky, let not thy sinking heart despair, but raise thy voice to God in prayer. Fear not lest, thus tempest tossed, thou shouldest be forever lost. God thy helper sure will be, will part the clouds and calm the sea. Yeah. Yeah. All right. We'll go through some of these comments here. Let's see. Oh, I'm way down there. Holy cow. Holy cow. Holy cow. Let's see. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Nice of you to choose a passage related to St. Francis Xavier on his feast day. I'll tell you, to be really honest, <laughs> um, I, it was just part of it. It was part of the way that this goes. Isn't that cool, though? Isn't that, we're on the right track, aren't we? Those little things like that. I think we're on the right track. And tell me, by the way, how is all of what we just said not controversial? But that's not the kind of thing we were talking about earlier about, you know, controversial channels getting busted for junk. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, holy cow. Holy cow. Okay, sorry it's taking me so long here. Yeah, thank you, Jake. Jake Fowler doing amazing work. Yeah, really amazing work. Yeah, very, very grateful for all of these uh, individuals here. Let's see here. Let's see. Maybe sailors had a part to play, but the greater part of the spread of Arianism was the synagogues. It'll be an interesting thing. Again, no bishops, priests, uh, and sailors. Yeah, look, okay. I yeah, I was gonna say uh, it'd be a little bit interesting. Teresa says I like this guy. You know, I uh, am very, very grateful. I don't know if you're talking about me or if you're talking about Jake. I hope you like both. <laughs> but if you have to like one or the other, like Jake. He's he's a good he's a good man. <laughs> he's a good guy. He is a good guy. Yeah, let's see here. Yeah, organic uh, organist says the music is really fitting. Yeah, I think so too. The end of the, at the end of that segment. Yeah, totally, one hundred percent. All right. Yeah, very glad to hear people talk about how much they appreciate that. Jacob Fowler, Howlin, uh, Triple Cross, great job. Yeah, nice work, David and Fowler. See, look, are you are you glad by the way that we did this? Are you glad for the way that that this show is developing over time? I hope so, because I know I am. I know I am. Let's see.
And I'm not going to get involved in, in, in uh, disputes that are taking place between different people. Yeah, and White Wolf, you're good, buddy. <laughs> you're fine. You're fine, my folks. I, I'm assuming you're a dude. <laughs> I'm making the assumption. You know, over here at Meaning a Catholic, man, there's a lot of guys. You know, I, I'm not actually accustomed to that. My old show was like 90% ladies. It's just true. You know, I talked about politics, family, a lot about my daughter raising children and stuff like that. And it wasn't, it wasn't uniquely Catholic. Like, everybody knew that I was Roman Catholic. We would talk about it from time to time. But it wasn't a Catholic show on a Catholic channel. Well, it, well, it, it did broadcast over many Catholic channels. But it wasn't, it wasn't like this. Like, meaning of Catholic. I mean, it, come on now. <laughs> That's like an obvious thing. So you're going to get certain kinds of people in here. Let's see. Benoit says eternal truths are controversial stuff. I know. And I, that's what I was saying. Like, I'm using it in a, in a different way. I'm using it in a, in a different way. Yes, of course. I think what I said right now was controversial. And yet, at the same time, it's not the kind of controversy that's going to land you. I mean, I, I can't imagine that talking about fleeing from a perverted situation where someone's wanting to do the naughty with you, that that's, you know, YouTube's going to go, banned. <laughs> You know, but that but that's more important to be quite frank than some than some passing moment flash of a pan current event story that somebody is pontificating off the cuff about. This would be an eternal truths kind of thing. I'm dead serious about it. Now. Let's see. Yeah, Benoit says conservatism and traditionalism is the new counterculture. Totally 100%. It's, it's, a, it's a rebellious act in a secular age to get on your knees and pray. It's a rebellious act in a secular age to flee from indiscretion, to cherish uh, uh, chastity and virginity. It is rebellious in that age to do that. You're a freak and a geek at that point. Why aren't you just blending in? Why are you making everybody feel guilty? What, you think it's wrong that I'm out there having so many partners? You think that's wrong? Yeah, I, th I think you're like a temple of idols for right now. What? I think you're filled with evil spirits. What? How dare you? How dare you say that? Me and my polyamorous partners, we disagree. It is what it is. Bunch of weirdos, to be quite frank. And I don't want to chalk them up just as weirdos. There's pe there are people you got to pray for. People you got to really, you really, really have to, to pray for them. You have to be an example to them because they don't have very many examples left. And so many of the examples they have are really bad ones. I'm not going to get into conversations about racialism. Not going to do it. Plus, I've already said my piece on stuff like culturism and stuff like that. People can find out. My, my stuff is on, on YouTube, publicly available. But I'm not, I'm not going to get into all that. Let's see. Yeah, Peter says, funny, people fear COVID-19, but don't fear disobeying the dogmas of the Catholic Church. That's a, I, I agree with you. I agree with you. They're, 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 they're terrified of that. Right, that they're terrified of these things, and it's because we're in a secular age of an eminent humanistic frame, and so, so to them, it's 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 exclusive humanism, it's exclusive materialism. The, the whole world is nothing but atoms bumping into each other and stuff, and that that you're here today, you didn't plan on being here, you're not here for a purpose, you're as pointless as the little blue dot that Carl Sagan talks about. But you you somehow you have this terrible thing that happened where you now have this sense of self. And you don't want to die. You don't want to experience the pain. And you're willing even to download yourself into a transformer to make yourself live forever. Because it's the only hope you think you have. And so when something happens and a virus comes and all of a sudden the issue of death arises, everything inside of them. And that's how you know, isn't it, isn't it a weird turn of events? How, for, how many years now have you heard atheist people say that religion is nothing more than just ceremony and everything wrapped around a fear of death? That that's what drives religious people. 
if that's true, if that is true, then they are the most fanatical, enthusiastic cult I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> I mean, think about it. Think about the kind of fear constant. Ah, ah, the monster outside. Ah, I might come and get me. And they have no concept because they think that as soon as it's done, they're gone and that they're going to be forgotten. And you know what? In, in most cases, they're actually right about the latter. They will be forgotten. If for no other reason, they can rest assured of this because they don't remember the names of kings and people much greater than them all throughout history. And they're terrified of that. They're terrified of not being known. In fact, somebody yesterday, uh, I think it was yesterday, there was a little, a little guy. I don't, know, I don't know how he died, but it was, it was trending on Twitter, you know. It was just a name. Benedict. Benedict was his name. And so the, the mom put out there, tweeted something and said, I just wanted to just share a picture of my son. My son died uh, suddenly. My son died, and I just wanted to say he existed. She's keenly aware of the fact that most people will go on the rest of their lives and not even know, and that the few people who do, those intimate friends and family members and associates who do, um, most of them will continue moving on with their lives. And at no fault of their own, they do have their own lives to live. But at the same time, that mom won't. That mom will go on, Lord willing. By the sound, I mean, you know, I name your kid Benedict. You might be on to a little something, something. You know, but the thing is, is, you know, that, that this idea of saying the fear of just he's gone and it's like opening your eyes into this magical world and then closing them and it's like you were just a blip. And there's a real, there's a real existential fear of this. Well, that's on steroids with, you know, the poke poke and the on your face. <laughs> True. Yeah, okay. Uh, someday a real pope will proclaim those as dogmas. Okay, yeah, mm -hmm. well, you know, hey. You should try for the position, I guess. <laughs> a real one? A real one? Oh, man. Do we have not real ones right now? <laughs> Give me a break. Give me a break. You know, it's, it's only people, you know, I mean, it's like, you know, a little fanatical, a little enthusiastic to say that, you know, that kind of thing. I don't know. I don't know where that's coming from. <laughs> uh, let's see. Yeah, Nick says, at least you guys still are nice to me, even though I am annoying. Um, Nick, I don't know who's being nice to you. I'm going to have to talk to him about that. <laughs> don't be nice to Nick Monk. <laughs> no way. He's too annoying. He's too annoying. Oh, but those, the heart face and the eyes and the heart and stuff. Uh, all right, I guess. <laughs> well, we'll treat you okay, Nick. Hopefully we'll see you over the, uh, at the chat. Yeah, maybe maybe Pope Francis could proclaim that a dogma, White Wolf. He said Pius XII should. He should have done that. Yeah, I mean, look, you know, so should John Paul II. So maybe you should, if you know, if you think so, right? Is it is it a contentious debate? Is it something that people have you know, been debating over? Does it reach that level? Yeah, Benoit, real Pope. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm with you, man. Yeah, don't even get me started on Pius XII. Guys, don't get him started on Pius XII. Don't even do it. Don't even do it. Enthusiast alert. Okay, yeah. I love you, by the way. <laughs> yeah, the enthusiast alert. Enthusiast alert. All right. Yeah, we're going way over time. I'm sorry about that. I hope I'm not getting into trouble. Let's see. And there's a lot more. Oh, goodness gracious. A lot more. I'm going to keep this up. I'm going to go ahead. I'm not, I'm not just going to go through the small ones. We'll just, we'll, we'll deal with the bigger ones here. We'll deal with the bigger ones. Let's see. Nope, they're all done. <laughs> I'm not going to go through. I thought it would be fun to do, but I don't know if there's a video coming up on me a Catholic and I'm still rolling. I got to get out of here. What are you guys doing commenting all the time? Like you're having fun or something. <laughs> What's happening? It's like I'm taking crazy pills over here. 
Yeah. Camo's lying, says he was involved in the anime scene for many years. He wasn't. He was on the sidelines. I, I know it. <laughs> he was on the sidelines. It's, it's, he's faking it. <laughs> oh, man. Let's see. Yeah, you can keep bringing up quotes, but ultimately, if you're going to call yourself Catholic, then you got to accept all matters of dogma and doctrine, including infallible canonizations. Look, people haven't learned from the lesson of the Jansenists. The Jansenists... The Augustinas had nothing but a treasure trove of quotes. Those folks were really good. And it, look, doesn't that say something? You can quote all day long. I know some brothers over at, you know, a trailer park monastery that are doing the same kind of thing. Just quote after quote after quote after quote after quote after quote. All day long. So what? That, you ain't even original, by the way. They're like, well, I have, what are you going to do? It's like, it's like a, a peeing, you know, match, Right? I can I can go further than you. <laughs> and you're like, you're like, oh, everybody's measuring it out and saying, well, he does have one more quote than you do. Irrelevant, man. The church isn't like, there's a book over here that has a lot of quotes in it. That settles the sky. What a weird ecclesiology, by the way. That's poop, poop, McScoop dupes. Yeah. Let's see. And someone said forced marriage is not good. I want to get back up there and see if I can see if I can do it here. Mm. I think I went too far. Yeah, no television or movies. Who's making up this rule? Who's making up that rule that the popes have said too much about movies and television? Look. Yeah. No. Things in moderation, man. Things in moderation. That it, that world ends up being a little bit, you know, a little bit ridiculously and I and I'm not meaning this just in a, in a in a way that's like a pass by jab kind of thing like I'm driving by and sucker punching somebody, you know, jogging or something. I've never done that, but <laughs> but I'm not saying that's not what this is, but to say it's 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 a a strange kind of uh, uh, puritanical idea about that, you know. And look, that's a little bit in the books here, a little bit in, in the books here. Even by Lassance, he talks about you know don't drink any alcohol at all. He's, he he had a real issue with some of that, and some of that was the the area he was part of at the time. And there are serious issues with that, or no tobacco use at all. And I'd go, yeah, I don't, you know, I don't agree with everything you got to say. Let's see. All right, we're coming down to the end. Yeah, all right, we're down at the end. All right. Yep. Hello from uh, hello from Sweden. Hello to you and goodbye. <laughs> goodbye. Why? Because we're at the end of the show. Because we are at the end of the show. I want to tell you. Look, I'm grateful for all of you. Oh, see this right here, League of Christ Sovereign. I just got word recently that League of Christ Sovereign got they they got a message from somebody. There's a group of six guys. They've been getting together for a while, and and they, but they didn't, they weren't part of something bigger than themselves, right? They were just they were just their own little group, and they saw the video right here where we interviewed my buddy Peter Michael Burke Jr., right? He's the, he's the creator of SpongeBob memes with Catholic themes, and he's the president of the League of Christ Sovereign. And they saw the interview, they loved the interview, they reached out to him, and it's the newest addition to the group. It's the newest addition. I don't, I, I'm hoping that they'll meet with everybody at the, uh, in Washington, D.C., for the March for Life. Because I know Peter Michael Burke and a bunch of the guys are going to that. My son will also be there, okay? That's his first time going, being part of the march. He's going with kids from the school and the church. It's going to be a bunch of fun. But I just want to say, we're doing great things. Our prayer group, bringing, bringing little baby cubs into the world, praying them through. Big, big congratulations again, Timothy Gordon. Yes, Tim and Steph, you two are amazing. And I'm really glad you're making a bunch of babies. 
right? <laughs> Glad that you're making a bunch of babies and raising them to be little warriors, little retrogrades. Very grateful for that. Of course, grateful to uh, Raphael and Taylor and the new baby Alphonsus, right? Grateful to, to Brianna, okay, the Lamb family and their new little Raymond. Grateful to all them and to all the people who come to the Wolfpack chat, who come to Meaning of Catholic, who go on Telegram. You can find the links right down below. Join that group of people. It's awesome. We're super connected and we'd love to get to know you and to pray for you and to have you pray with us. Until next time, never give up. Keep on smiling and momento more. I wanted to make people dream bigger thoughts.